Everybody, good morning. My name is Lance Marshall. I am the Senior Associate Pastor here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth, and welcome to the gathering. If you haven't already, please make sure to get some coffee and something to eat from the rear of the room. We do drink coffee and eat food during the entire worship service, so if at any point you need a refill, please feel free to get up and help yourself. Also, if you need to use the restroom or if kids need to stretch their legs, you can head through the door at the rear of the room and through the garden into the main body of the church. You'll find everything that you need waiting for you in there. Some of the eagle-eyed among you may have noticed that I'm not physically present with you today. I'm actually filling in in our sanctuary at the 9.30 and 11 worship services there today. Uh, in the meantime, we have a very special guest leading us. Reverend Mike Ramsdale is one of my role models in church leadership. Uh, he's been an incredibly effective and powerful pastor for years here in the Central Texas Conference. Uh, most recently at First Methodist Mansfield where he led that church through year after year after year of growth and impacting the community and making new disciples. Mike, I cannot thank you enough for being here. Mike now specializes in helping churches tell their stories and evangelize and engage their community in new and interesting ways. I uh, asked him to come here and to share with us. And again, Mike, thank you for blessing us with your presence. Now we are going to do what we always do. We're going to pass the baskets. Two things go in the baskets every week. The first is our attendance cards. Whether this is your first time or your 100th time here at the gathering, please make note of your attendance here today and pass it in the basket as it comes around. The second thing that goes in the baskets are our tithes and our offerings. Our tithes and our offerings are what makes it possible for our church to fulfill the mission that God has given us. All of the connection, all of the worship, all of the new people, all of this is possible because of your faithful giving to our church. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining my family and other families in living sacrificially so we can give generously to God's mission here at the church. Now, if you would all please stand, we are going to begin with our invocation. Savannah is going to lead us. Standard church rules apply. She's going to read the leader portion, and we're all going to read out loud the bold in italics. God bless y'all, and I'll see you soon. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. We are hungry for the bread of heaven. Jesus said, the bread of God gives life to the world. We are hungry for eternal life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. We are here to become what we already are, the body of Christ for a hungry world. Amen. Well, good morning, and welcome to the gathering. Um, we're going to sing and worship together. We have our special guest here, Mike Ramsdell. He's, I personally have known him since I was like this big. Yeah, <laughs> since, since I was uh, microscopic, I'm not much bigger now, but um, he's amazing, uh, so I'm really looking forward to his message today. Um, let's sing together.
guys may be seated. Thank you. I'm a lot taller than Savannah. <laughs> so every time we gather together to pray, we speak to God knowing that God listens. We listen to God knowing that God speaks to us. We do this through what we call prayers of the people. This is a guided time of prayer and response that I'll lead us in today. First, we'll begin with a prayer of confession. Prayers of confession aren't about being hard on ourselves or negative. They're about honestly acknowledging where God is reaching each and every one of us today. I'll finish with a call, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll respond by saying, hear our prayer. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. <clears throat> Sorry, I lost my place here. <laughs> God is a trinity. The language we use most often for the Trinity is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and so we have a Trinitarian prayer using that same language. After we're finished, I'll lift up some names, and then I'll ask, are there any others? When I ask, it's your chance to say out loud the names of anyone in your life you wish to pray for. These could be prayers of thanksgiving, for good news, blessings, or answered prayers in their lives. Or these could be prayers for mercy, prayers for comfort, prayers for healing and encouragement, prayers for anything that these people may require in their times of need. We pray all this knowing that God, always and everywhere, God hears our prayers. Let us pray together. Tender, loving God, have mercy on us. Like David, we've been greedy, grasping for what is not ours, even though we have enough. We have forgotten your promise that you will fill us with the bread of life. Like the crowd that followed Jesus to Capernaum, yet did not understand what he had given them. We seek bread for our bodies more than we seek the bread of heaven. Forget our sins, take away our guilt, Purge us with hyssop, and we shall be clean. Tender, loving God, have mercy on us. And Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Father God, you're the creator of all things, everything and everything that you create and proclaim to be good. Evidence of the goodness of your creation continues to testify all around us. New lives, new families, new jobs, new friends, new opportunities. For all these blessings, we give you thanks, Lord. Lord, in your mercy hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, everything you create, you make to be free. Over and over again, that freedom is used for purposes of sin, for separation from you, for violence, for greed, for hatred, for oppression. Remind us that when we are at our worst, you did not give up on us or turn away from us. Instead, you joined us, came alongside us in the power and presence of your son, Jesus Christ, not to condemn us, but that through the power of life, death, and resurrection, we might be reconciled and brought back to you once and forever. For the salvation you offer to us in Jesus, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. Your Always and everywhere, O oh God, we are never alone. Through the Holy Spirit, guide us, penetrate us, shower us with your grace, shining a light before our feet so that we might learn to walk in your ways. For your presence, your love, and your guidance, O oh God, we give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy. For Julie, Lord, in your mercy. Your For Chuck, Lord, in your mercy. Your For Bill, Lord, in your mercy. Your Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Your Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. For all the names spoken out loud and all the names kept in the silence of our hearts, hear our prayers. For all who seek the strength to face another day of difficulty and pain, hear our prayers. For all who seek to change their hearts and lives and to find peace in you, hear our prayers. And for each and every one of us seeking to experience your love and know your will, hear our prayers. Guide us, keep us, make us into your people. And Lord, in your mercy. All right, thank you all. I'm going to ask Reverend Mike Ramsdell to come up and speak for us. Thank you. It's good to be here today. And uh, one of the things about the gathering that's really exciting for me is that uh, about a year ago when I came on this new task that I have for the conference, again, helping churches grow and expand their life and mission together. I'm really enjoying that. Other things as well. I'm a DS of the New Church Start District as well, so any new church starts really kind of belong to me. Uh, but in that same category, I wanted someone to come and teach other churches how to really add to the life of the church through programs like this, gatherings like this. And, and Lance and Tim came and taught uh, about 80 other churches how to do this. 
uh, and simply share their story, how they came together, how this began. And so you already have made an impact by simply existing, serving God well, making a difference, serving this area in a very unique, very special way. So we got to share that with uh, the community beyond that in this part of Texas. So I thank you for that and want to share that, that as well. And Savannah, of course, no Savannah well, as she pointed out. Uh, I remember her when I, I first started seeing her, her little sister, actually older sister, but she's a littler, if that's possible. Uh, and uh, they sat near the front with their mom, and they came with little tiny little frilly dresses, these fluffy kind, you know, I don't know, you can buy those anymore. And sat there in the front row, just sitting there very quiet and, uh, and giggly. And here she is leading worship today. I didn't know that until I looked online and thought, hey, Savannah's leading here. So thank you for sharing uh, with this church family, with us. And Rhonda and I are glad to, to see you today. My wife is here, Rhonda. Thank you, Rhonda, for joining me. Our friends Art and Mary Scott have come as well. So celebrate their presence here. And I'm going to begin by telling a very simple story. In my, in my own journey, I grew up in the United Methodist Church. Uh, we attended off and on, military family, so we lived all over the world, that type of story. Uh, but when I uh, got out of high school, uh, I really left faith completely if I ever had any. So really for me, the idea of faith or God or personal stuff related to Christ, the church, is pretty nothing at 18. Joined the military, spent two years, and after two years of the nothing of faith that I was living... Uh, no community, certainly, that I might experience, no understanding of God at all beyond there might be one. I found myself on a night watch, and it was uh, kind of late, maybe 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning on that 12-hour night watch in a barracks. Uh, I was confronted with a Bible verse, just one verse, one verse where it says in Revelation, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with them and they with me. And I thought, I'm going to give that a shot. And so I prayed, said, God, I can't think I hear you knocking, Jesus. And, and I said, come in. And I did that, and my life was changed very dramatically, very quickly in that experience with God. Went to church that Sunday for the first time in two years. I went somewhere in high school. My mom would make me go, or she would cry if we didn't go, so we'd go with her. But went on my own. Uh, and, there, uh, and there I walked into Sunday school for the first time since I was probably about 13. Uh, because I had a friend who said, let's go to Sunday school. Uh, he was the only guy I thought in the entire squadron that I was in who thought might be remote, remotely a Christian. The rest, I was confident they were not. <laughs> but I thought, this one guy might be, where did he go to church? He said, let's go to Sunday school. So I went with him, and we sat there in a very small class, and in that small class, the, the, the teacher, the, the lady said, you know, the pastor wants people who have talent to be able to do something in our church, and so I'm going to see who has the ability to sing. And so we went in a circle, and she had everybody sing <laughs> some song to see if we were talent. You know, I, I'm sitting there thinking, I still remember this panicking, thinking, I wonder if Moody Blues is appropriate, or, or Black Sabbath, you know, or, or Deep Purple, you know, some people know I'm talking about, some don't, but those are the groups back in those days, and I'm thinking, no, nah, they probably don't mean that one. So I sang the only song I could think of. I sang, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I was at choir practice on Wednesday night. <laughs> and I thought, so this is what Christians do. Okay, that's what we do, what we do. Now, what I'm telling you, though, is my story. And you simply can't argue with me at all, can you? I can go here and say you could argue with that, or I could say this, I heard this, and they could argue. But you can't argue with my story. That's my story. You know, that's a fact for me personally. And the art of evangelism is simply telling our story. A story that simply is that I needed God and God was there. Or I had a problem and the Lord helped me. Or I needed support and a friend said, I'm praying for you. But that's our story. And we're afraid of evangelism because we think it's got to be some involved, exotic list of things that help them understand who God is. We've got to persuade them. We've got to argue with them. We've got to somehow, some kind of reasonable way of putting it together. They're going to say, oh, yeah, that makes sense to me. When the reality is, the only thing that really makes sense to anyone is the story that we share. The need we have of God and how God has met our need and God has blessed us in our need. And while I'm going to read Luke 15, verse 1 through 10, uh, and I'll share, I'll read all, all those verses. It's a parable. You'll probably, some recognize, some may not, but about the parable of a lost sheep, 100 sheep, one's gone, 
find the other. In light of that going to be told in a moment, my wife and I, Rhonda, for a number of years, did a program we called Preacher's Pals, where we took a bunch of kids out to fun activities in smaller churches. We couldn't do that at Mansfield. It was too, too big, too many kids. But we did it earlier, and we went to the, the, I'm pretty sure it was a Fort Worth Zoo, and we had about 30 kids there with us, had a great time. It was all fun. Zoos are fun. Taking kids to see animals, the, the camel and the elephant and the lion, that's all fun. Until toward the end of the day, we said, let's count one more time. We were one short. Now, being one short, you know, we had a number of options. One option was we could have said, let's go back anyway and tell them 29 out of 30. That's not bad. You know, but we recognized right away, no, that's not appropriate. We got to find this kid who we found very rapidly. He was standing in ice, getting ice cream, something like that. And we found him right away, bought him back, and we all celebrated. But I'm telling you, what was a fun day at the zoo became a frantic search for a kid. The transition was immediate, it was rapid, it was fast. That became, hear me please, all that mattered was that. Nothing else mattered but finding this little kid that we had misplaced, lost, however term you want to use. The story that I'm going to read, the setting is uh, they're at a dinner and Jesus is at, is at the dinner. And the dinner uh, is full of what the Bible says were publicans and sinners. Now, publican was a tax collector. In those days, you collected taxes uh, from, uh, the, from your own people and gave them to the Romans who were like Nazi occupiers in your land. So you were a bad person if you were a publican back in those days or a tax collector. No one liked you. You were on the outside of everything. And the sinners were those who simply did not keep the laws the religious leader said you were supposed to keep. And they had a list of what those laws were, very involved, how you ate, how you prepared food, what you did, did and did not do on the Sabbath, how you dressed. Every detail of life was ordered by the religious laws of those days. And so a sinner was those who lived outside those religious laws, which was almost everyone, except for the religious leaders, Pharisees and Sadducees and a few others. And certainly publicans were that. And Jesus was there having dinner with all of them. Now, when you ate with someone in those days, it goes back to the first story I told about my own come in and eat with me and, and I with you, Lord, and, and that took place and still does, uh, that in that, in that sense, they would, they would, they, if you ate with someone, that was an honor that was really high. You were affirming them if you came to their house. In our life, we affirm people by inviting them to our home. You come to my house, I'm saying, you're, I like you, uh, I want to serve you, and I want to be friends with you. But in that case, no, it was saying yes, I'll go to your house. So he was affirming them by being present with them, which was very unique. And so a couple of religious leaders came to, because they wanted to be affirmed by Jesus too. He was becoming more and more popular. So they wanted to have that connection. But also, just in case he messed up, they could correct him. Make sure that the Son of God knew how you're supposed to live as the Son of God. You're doing it incorrectly, Jesus, by eating with publicans and sinners. And so he says in these verses, they were grumbling about that. And now I read chapter 15, verse 1 through 10. And I'm sorry for talking fast, but you're used to Lance, so you can handle it. <laughs> Back when I said, Lance, good, I'll come take your place. You talk as, talk as fast as I do, so they won't be shocked like some people are. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So do you hear the story? The sinners and tax collectors were all there. They just wanted to hear Jesus. They just wanted to be present with the Lord. They wanted to experience God's love. They wanted that moment that I experienced where God has want you in my life. That's all. That's all I'm looking for. I don't, I don't know anything else anyway. I can't explain it all anyway. That's all I want. And that's what God gave me. And that's what they were. But the Pharisees and religious leaders were not there for that reason. They were there to simply accuse, create division, cause problems, and this is what they did. And so they simply muttered, instead of listening to Jesus, they muttered about Jesus. That listening to God present among them, they chose instead to complain about him not doing it their way, following their expectations, not living out the story they expected that he should live. And so, verse 3, he tells them a parable. I know you know that well here. Lance is good at teaching you this. It's, a, it's simply a story that illustrates something. Suppose one of you 
has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Now, they never heard these kind of stories before. That's not how faith was communicated, how the, church, how, how, how the Jewish people taught. That was new to them. That's what Jesus did when he taught. And so he tells them a story about something they're familiar with. They know about sheep. There are shepherds everywhere. There are hillsides all around where they see sheep. Uh, they depend upon sheep for livelihood, many of them. Part of their story. He tells them something they know very, very well. Evangelism is part of telling people, going to where people know something already and bring them to where you want them to go. And then he goes on to say, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And he calls his friends and neighbors and rejoices with them. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. See how things change in that, re- in that reading. Now, all sheep are important, but what is Jesus saying? The title of my message today is 100 minus 1 equals 0. Now, no math whizzes. No, that's not really how it works numbers-wise. But it is when it comes to our own faith as Christians either in in that journey or thinking about that journey, it becomes about the one, not about the 99. Now, that is antithetical to any way that we think in the world that we live in. Especially in America, consumer nation, we know how money adds up and how it's supposed to work. We understand what success is and what it isn't. And here, Jesus' success is that one who's lost, finding their way back into faith and how God builds the kingdom through that story. How God makes it work. Don't you know? He said, don't you know? Don't you agree it's about this one sheep? And they said, well, I got it. Yeah, I guess so. That's true. Uh, The one sheep is of value to the shepherd, so he or she is going to go find that lost sheep. So for us, in in a very real way, evangelism is figuring out what's important and what's not to us. In this case, Jesus said the sheep, the one, is of value. And he also says, let me tell you about me. It's this this group of publicans here who are wealthy, who steal from you, who give money to the Romans, who help perpetuate this system of oppression here in our community where the Romans have taken over our land and we're simply occupied by them, but they're important to me. I want you to know they are important to me. Then he points to the sinners, and sinners were very popular. They were everywhere because anyone who did not keep the law the way the Pharisees taught, which was everybody, was somehow a sinner. The rules were so involved and intricate, nobody could possibly keep them if they knew what they were. They, of course, had Old Testament laws uh, uh, called the law, and they added to that books that would simply explain those laws, and, and the material to explain what keeping the Sabbath was was a book as thick as this. So there were scrolls back in those days. So a lot of material to explain what keeping the Sabbath was. In fact, it couldn't be done by anyone. And so they were automatically in the category of being condemned and judged by the religious leaders. Look at us, how special we are. Jesus says, that's who's important to me. That's what I care about. The main point then is the lost sheep is important, of high value to the shepherd. Don't you know that? At least a couple years later, the cross where Christ crucified simply says to those outside and around him who are causing his death, who are causing his pain, who have created this season of uh, a terrible crucifixion, and he says simply, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So he reaches out to the lost sheep he's surrounded by who are putting him on a cross. We understand evangelism that way, how God values you and me and what it means to, uh, to be a follower of Christ ourselves and, the, and the, the idea of the parable of the missing. That's what this is about. It's about the missing. Uh, we know in the research we've done for this area of Fort Worth, and I've done a lot of that because of my job doing that, uh, but more than 80% of people here do not go to church at all. That's, that's a lot of people. That's four out of five have no connection with the church. 
And many of those here would say they're unchurched entirely in the sense they have no connection, nor do they want a connection to a church. And there are many who have no sense of what religion is, much less what being a Christian might be, or have any idea what it is to say, Jesus, I want you to eat with me and I with you. Because my story says, that's a pretty good deal. It's a pretty good deal. The friends that are with us this morning, we had breakfast, and I said, let's go to the hearth. It's a new place. They had been, as it turned out, but we wanted to share that with them because we discovered that place, and they got great avocado toast. You know, we thought you didn't, and we had no problems. At, Let's eat there, we, you know, because it's important to us, and it's a good meal. We know the people who run it, and we thought they would too, and they'd enjoy that. And so we have the same story when it comes to saying, hey, this Jesus business is pretty good. I like it. I'm guessing you get through life because of sense that there is a God, might be a God, or you know that God to be revealed in Christ in a very real, loving, caring way, as we sang this morning. Savannah led that, and you decided to come to church in this hot summer Sunday and sit here and worship and pray, and they're going to ask for money while we're here. A little basket's going to pass around, and you're here anyway. The church built around the God that can bless it is built around those who are not here yet. So I want you to hear that today. A little bit what Lance, I think, wanted me to share, and very important to me. The church that God can bless is built around those who are not here yet, not around those that are. It's built around the one that's out there we're still looking for, not the 99 who are present, no matter how important we are. It's not built around the likes and, and dislikes and the wants and wishes and the traditions and non-traditions of those who have made a commitment to that church. It says built around the sense we want to reach new people. And that's what I love about the gathering is designed for that purpose designed for anybody to walk in the door and say, you know, this is okay. I like this. Church I grew up in, which was a United Methodist church, was not made for me. It was not made for 15-year-old boys when I was that age. Traditional and music and robes and what are they talking about? There was nothing about it that appealed to me because it wasn't aimed at me. It wasn't aimed at my friends. It wasn't aimed at those who were not already what we would call then just Methodists. You know, uh, but now we begin to think, how do we aim churches at that person out here who's not attending? You've done that. Comfortable. You can walk in the door, give me a kolache and a cup of coffee, and I can spill it if I have to. Don't, but I can spill it if I need to. It'll be all right. Nobody's going to yell at me, and I can sit where I want to, and we're just going to have church together, and somebody's going to say something. I hope it's good. I, if it's not, I don't have to listen. And we come and we talk about reaching those people. So who are they out there? How do you recognize who they are to realize it's the 100 minus 1 equals 0? And the churches who don't care about that person out there is a 0. They do. It's everything in our walk and service of God, how we live. Jesus also said, the sick that need a physician is not the well, which for him was everybody. They just didn't recognize who they were. They just thought they didn't need what God came to offer them. They weren't aware of their need of love and grace and mercy and salvation. They thought they could somehow make it happen by keeping those laws that they so celebrated that were destroying uh, the very nation that God came to give to the world. He said, also, I have come to seek and to save the lost. That's what Jesus said. when he's, what, what are you here for? Well, I want you to know that's what God is still doing in the world. He's never going to stop doing that. If you want to see where God is active, what God's about, what God is doing, what God's interested in, where God is working, well, this is what he's doing. He's trying to see, and seeking to save those who don't know God loves them yet, who aren't aware there are people who will accept them and say, hey, there's a place for you among us. We want you here at this table. Don't know yet there's a God full of grace who can change and turn a life around, help people recover from addictions, whatever they might be, and point to a better life the way God intended for it to be at the very beginning. Garden Eden tells that story somewhat. So that's, and he also said, the first shall be last, the last shall be first. And so everything is turned around in church. When you walk in the door, it's not the preacher with the name tag, he's got some kind of title. Not the guy or the, or the woman wearing the robe, you know, that's got all that white paramounts or green or whatever color it is right today. You know, in fact, I told Rhonda this morning, I'm not wearing a tie. I don't, they may wear a tie or not. I don't know. I'm not wearing one. And so, uh, and so, as you see, I'm not wearing a tie. It's about that person who's visiting for the very first time. If you've been here, here the very first time, it's today. Maybe the second or third time. Maybe you've not been to church in a while. Uh, this season is about you. 
It's not about the person who's been here for 50 years or 40 years and always going to church. It's not about my wife and I've been going to church since, uh, faithfully for 45 years, you know, in, in our life and 43 years together as husband and wife. That's how we've done it. But, but it's not about us. It's about, about them. You know, can we think like that? Is that possible? Is it possible to have our mind turned toward the Sunday morning? Lord, I have a lot of needs, but Lord, I'm thinking about the person at the back who may have greater needs than me. They may not know you love them yet. They may not be aware that God created them. They may not know that there's a Christ who can fill them with grace and hope and joy if they choose to accept that. We may not be aware that we really do accept them. We really want them here. We, we want them to be part. We want to have a friendship with them. We really want the first shall be last. The last shall be first, turning everything around. This is what God is doing in the world, and he invites us to participate in that. So church is about participation. And that's what the word evangelism is. It simply means just telling the story, good news in your life. I told you my story a little bit, good news in my life story about how I came to a personal faith and how it changed my own journey. A college a few years later, a marriage pretty quickly, a, a life beyond that to a seminary. I've been a minister now for 40 years as of, as of July, this, July this, this last month. Uh, and that's been our story. It comes from that. Come to Christ. Jesus loves me. And I thought, this is following Christ. You sing a little song in your Sunday school class. Okay, so what you got to do if that's what it's supposed to be? And so I sang Jesus Loves Me today and 40 years later, I found myself sitting on kind of a, a hard ground in Zimbabwe. We were there, we were helping some kids at an orphanage that we had kind of adopted as a church. At that time, we had purchased food for them. All the food came from us, uh, clothing. Uh, we also... Uh, uh, purchase uniforms for them because to go to school, you have to have a uniform. Even though the orphanage has a school right there, you couldn't attend it without a uniform. So we helped them do that, bought them sewing machines to make their own uniforms. We did all that for them. And we went out there for a medical mission to help serve them physically because it's a very poor area out in the middle of nowhere in Zimbabwe. Discovered that half were starving and the other half had AIDS. It was a little bit of kids. It was an awful experience in some ways, a beautiful experience in other ways. And that was where we were. And I found myself sitting there because years before I said, hey, I want you to have dinner with me and I with you. And I found that to do that meant that now I had to walk with Jesus. Now I had to care about what he cared about. And I had to realize that those lost sheep that I have been are still important to him, so they had to be important to me. And so it changed everything. And so that journey eventually led to that place there, there in Zimbabwe. And at that point, uh, three little girls came up while I'm sitting there on a break. Needed lots of breaks. It wasn't easy to be there. The little girls, probably five years old, I'm guessing. Little blue uh, Zimbabwean school uniforms. Couldn't speak a word of English, but they could sing. And they sang to me. Uh, we, we want, and, they, and they started singing in English. Maybe a few songs I knew. And they sang, twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder where you are. And they were like little peppy, happy little five-year-olds are anywhere on the earth. This is my own children, grandchildren. We have those uh, in our life. We love that, that large part of our family. Or those we see in Sunday school, those we'll see in the hallways here, a couple that are here today, maybe close to that age, just the same. And to think how much God loved them too and to bring, it, bring good news to them. And the day later, I got to preach to all of them with an interpreter about how much God loved them. How it leads us, where it takes us, where we go. Because we cannot follow Christ Unless we invest in his mission, and he said it clearly. He said, it's that lost sheep. If they didn't get it, he told a second story in the passage. Second story goes like this. Our supposed woman has 10 silver coins. Each coin might be a year salary. And loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. A lost coin. And they're saying, Yep, we look for that. That's important to us. We're not going to lose a year's wage, we're going to get a broom. Sweep this place till we find it. Churches that are effective, the center of their church is simply a broom that sweeps. Sweeps all around, whether it be in Zimbabwe, next door, in their own home, 
of the hallways of a church they managed to get people to attend. It's still about that, how important is the lost coin. Common sense. Sweep the house for it. Quit counting coins and start looking for that which is lost. In that story back in the, uh, the preacher's pals days there at the zoo, would have been a fun season of zooing became a frenzied search for a lost child. Somewhere there has to be a little bit of frenzy in a church. There are people out there who hurt. We know they need to know that God cares about them. We know what life is without that. We know what it's like maybe for us in our own story. We know we can't let that be. We can't let them know there, there's not a grace that can change their life. Not grace that can save a soul. There's not grace that can help somebody recover from life that's being destroyed by personal addictions. Or those who simply know in our crazy world, I can't find a place. I, I'm lonely, I'm isolated, and it's awful. We've got to do, we've got to have a frenziness in a church saying we can't do that and we can't let it be like that. We've got to do something different. We can't sit on the hillside watching our sheep in comfort which is what the Methodist church did for a long time. Traditions didn't change. Worship was the same. Churches all looked alike. Services all were identical. We all did it just the same because we were all sitting on a hillside together. And I grew up in this, so I know. Sitting on a hillside, watching the sheep, hearing the, the, the babbling brook go by, the green grass there, how peaceful and how nice and how good it is for me to be able to enjoy that moment. When the reality is, it's not about that at all. I've got to get up and go find that one that's lost, whether it's broken its leg or it's lost in a crevice or something can't find its way back because that's what's important to me and my church. The frenzied nature of change, of innovation, of creativity to reach a world that's changed faster than we have, which is what the gathering is about. And I celebrate that in a very unique way here. You must teach other people. Jesus said, come unto me. All ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. <laughs> Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you'll find rest for your souls. I know Lance and the dream for him, and you partner with him in that dream. I know Tim well, known him for years. His dream as well, in the same way. And that's what reach people we're not reaching already. We know how to reach who we have. We know exactly how what they expect, what they want, what they like, what matters to them. We know that already. But how about those that we're not reaching? Who, who are we not yet reaching? How can we do that? And you either have discovered that by being a part of the gathering, walking in the door one day and saying, I like this. I like what God's doing in my life here. Or you became a part because you saw there's something different here where I can reach, I can, be, I can partner with what God might be doing in this community of Fort Worth Rapidly resurging, changing, dynamic area. It's the best place to reach people when that's happening. You can do that in our, in our, in our category of faith. Uh, I'm going to pause for a second. I'm not keeping track of time. I'm used to doing that. How much time do I have? I couldn't hear that at all. I got five minutes. Okay. Um, and I'll, I'll move to a conclusion at this point, and I could say more. When you don't get to preach very often, you have a tendency to want to say everything that you know, but... And I'm, very, and I'm very, it's not that funny, I mean. <laughs> my friends aren't laughing at all. Oh, just keep saying, keep talking. Just keep on talking, brother. Don't stop. Um, but uh, a number of years ago, um, my brother, I have an identical twin brother, for those who don't know, who was a pastor at First Waco for 20 years. Uh, we've both been ministers in the Methodist Church for a long time. Uh, in fact, our stories are very, very similar because when I did what I did uh, there on that night watch, I called my brother who was in the John F. Kennedy in the Mediterranean. Not easy to call people back in 1973. But I made that phone call, uh, had a bunch of ship to shore, all kinds of stuff to finally get there. And he said, what's my brother calling me? Somebody died. Uh, and I said, I, I think you should reconsider the claims of Jesus. That's all I said. And so he, he did the same thing I'd done. And I've been ministers for many years now in response to that. Uh, but some, about seven, eight years ago, he found out he had cancer. Uh, he's doing really well today, but spent uh, eight weeks at MD Anderson, Monday through Friday for chemotherapy for prostate cancer. So eight weeks he was there, uh, came home on the weekend to preach because he could not do that, so he came back and preached. Uh, 
Uh, but then he'd go back for the following week. And while he was there, he thought, he thought of something. He thought of, you know, God is big enough for this. And I want to share that with my church. I want to share my story with my church. And so he called his assistant and said, I want you to, I want you to develop a wristband. I've got one on now called God is Big Enough. Uh, it's blue. They're all kind of colors. And, and, and so Waco developed one that's white and put the words on there and started giving them out. And, and sure enough, it wasn't long till uh, he called me on the phone and said, Mike, you need to do this. And I thought, okay, maybe I should, maybe I shouldn't. And so he, he did it. And so I, so I did it as well. At uh, Mansfield on Christmas Eve, we uh, ran off about, I'm uh, thinking about 7,000 uh, wristbands. We thought that would cover everybody who was going to attend church Christmas Eve. About 7,000 or so might be there. Let's have enough for everybody. And we ran out in the second service of about nine services, and they were, they were gone. Ordered 15,000 more, another 15,000, and we kept ordering them through the years. They still give them out at Mansfield today. Have given out probably, uh, and that, that church itself, maybe a million, I don't know. Uh, it's national now, all over the country. People are doing it as well. Uh, we began looking about what countries have actually had the God is Big Enough wristband, and I had a map, covered almost the entire map everywhere, ended up having a God is Big Enough wristband. I know you've done that here. Some might remember that, some might not. I believe some might be at the back. But the reason I'm going to close with that is, that we discovered why that really worked. And because it's a cool idea and the wristbands are blue or black or red and they're all kind of colors or we have them in five languages, that wasn't it either. Because somebody could say, I want you to tell, I want to share my story with you. And that is that God is big enough. And so they'd take a wristband off and they'd give it to somebody and say, hey, this is for you. And that was it. Because they were giving them their story. My story is God is big enough for me. And he is for you. Whether that person had cancer, or a neighbor who was simply uh, going through a season of depression, or someone who's going through a divorce, uh, or someone who simply doesn't know anything about God and wants to, what, what can I know that's possible to know? And, and they gave those out. It wasn't about wearing them at all. It wasn't about wearing them. It was about giving them away. And that continues today to be simply one of the ways, or many, simply tell a story which in the end is what evangelism is, telling a story that nobody can argue with. I need God, and that God has been there when I needed God. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the gathering. I thank you for those who are here today, those who've come to, to worship, to open their hearts, to simply listen, to maybe explore, maybe to simply be a partner with those they already know and are connected with. I pray you bless us according to the stories and words and scriptures that have been read and May you take that and apply it to our lives and our living, this church's service in the world that we live in, and those who have yet to hear that one who's still out there needs to know that God does really love them too. Our prayers in Jesus' name, amen. Now we pray the Lord's Prayer. I've been told is that before the communion or afterwards? It's afterwards. No one knows. I'm going to tell Lance they don't pay one bit of attention to you. They don't know what you're doing up there. Uh, they know you're wandering around a lot and walk a lot. That's all they know. Uh, so we'll, we'll do it after then communion. So if you would prepare your heart for the sacrament in the, our church, this sacrament is open to all. The table is God's table, not ours. And so it makes it yours. It's available to you. As in that story I read, they were eating together where everybody was there for whatever reason. And Christ is available to all as he is to you. As Jesus said, this is my body has been broken for you. See how much I love you. This is the cup of the New Testament, the blood of Christ. See how much grace is available to us, you and me today. We thank God today, today for these elements of bread and wine that are for us the body and blood of Christ. Amen. Y'all grab stuff however you think you're supposed to. table is open. We are one in the 
Spirit, we are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we pray that our unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. They will One of the really special things about communion is this, that, uh, so of course, Jesus Christ began this at the, at the Last Supper with his disciples, broke bread and gave it to them, and told them to serve it to others as long as, and we still do. So in a very real way, even a physical way, the hand of Christ touched bread, gave it to one on one side and one on the other, and they passed it. That's now been being passed to people for 2,000 plus years. So in a very real way, the first hand that touched the sacrament today was the hand of the Son of God and reached out to us and welcomed us to the table. In light of that, will you join me in praying the Lord's Prayer together out loud? Will you bow, please? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Prepare for a closing. I do want to take a vote. Uh, How many believe that Lance talks faster than I do? Raise your hand. How many think I talk faster? Oh, I'm better than Lance at one thing. (laughs) He's a good preacher and he has hair. For a while anyway, he has hair. So uh, celebrate that with, with Lance and love Lance. Talking about the lost sheep and the lost coin. Who is that in your life? 
Go and tell them God cares about them too. Amen.